Mr. Davies will do our print for us. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you to the choir. It was lovely, even though it's not Christmas. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Doug Davies. I've been living in Sheridan nine years. Something about that. We moved here, my wife and I moved here several years for that time because my grandsons live very nearby. My daughter lives with them, but that's not the reason why we moved here. Hope you understand that. Well, okay, she takes it. Uh, and I, I've not, well, a couple of thoughts. I have not worn a suit in about two and a half years. I put this on this morning. And it's big on me. <laughs> uh, in the time, in the last two and a half years, I lost about uh, 100 pounds. Uh, and then I regained half of it back. And so uh, uh, this morning, my wife has told me she knows what she's getting me for Christmas now. <laughs> Won't be a surprise. Or maybe for my birthday, which isn't far, that far off back. So, yeah, and I've shared with you some of my ventures over the last two and a half years, three years, with my, the cancer uh, diagnosis and the treatments, uh, at first weekly treatments and then monthly. And then a little while ago, about two months ago, I went, had the, my last appointment uh, with the doctor, and he has made a few more, but he, that's the announcement. And he, he took some blood, took a, a bone marrow biopsy, which is not the, I've discovered, not a fun thing to do, even though I've had a number of them now, do not want another one. And, but he came in and he, he announced to, to oh, myself and Ruth that they could not find a cancer cell in the body. Yay, amen. That's right. And I'm so, so glad for that. And a week or so later, I had a dream. Um, and it was people from, churches that I have served. Some people I knew right up front who they were, but then there was many, many beyond them. And they said, we've been praying for you, Doug. And I pray, felt the prayers from here as well. And so I'm very thankful for all those who have prayed and have brought me to this moment and, and to share with you uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, whatever may come our way. And then a, a few weeks ago, uh, Pastor John asked me if I would be willing to preach for him, and I really debated. I wasn't sure if I had the strength, but we will see. We, we will see. Uh, glad, glad that they've taken off some time and for me to share a message with you. And some of you ask, well, what am I going to be preaching about? And I'll preach about 20 minutes. I will give you some time to, you can put your clock, watches away, and that we won't go over. I can see the clock on the wall. Greg, it's your job when, you, when it's time you think, just put your hand up. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of Greg doing that. But, um, but Pastor John gave me plenty of time to prepare this message. And I went to the lectionary. Pastor John follows the lectionary uh, as well. And came, this came up as the scripture for today. Matthew, there's me, Mark 13, verses 1 through 8. It's about Jesus standing in front of those magnificent buildings of, of Jerusalem. And the disciples were saying, look at these. These are massive. These are, whoa, beautiful. And Jesus would say, not a stone will last. They will all fall. And I read that in the context of our election a few weeks ago. And, well, you know, I really, in many ways, I, I, maybe like you, I was dreading the election. I had to make a choice which way I would vote, which way I would turn. And I felt a sense of foreboding. The sermon this morning is not about politics, but it's about all those undercurrents of our time which led up to some of the choices we had to make in our voting. And I trust most of us did vote or made a choice not to vote. But this, the scripture really is about uh, the things that can go wrong. Those, those disciples as they were uh, 
Going back here for a minute. We're saying, well, look, teacher, these massive stones, these magnificent buildings, aren't they great? Not one. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. I think we live in a time where we, f some, we feel like that. The one thing that came to my mind over and over was Sears. Do you remember Sears? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe for the younger generation, now, what are you talking about? But Sears, well, every Christmas, I looked forward to their Christmas catalog for my wish book. And we would go visit the, uh, the Sears at Harlem and, and North Avenue in uh, outside of Chicago. And we would, you know, it's all gone. It's gone. And so many things have happened in the, the last few years that, that what we thought were lasting, everlasting, have disappeared or changed, evolved. Um, I want to say the stores are closing, but we went out yesterday and there's a lot of people in the parking lots getting ready for uh, uh, Christmas. But you know, we have the social sh shifts of our society. Wildfires in New England. Here's the drought out east. There's also a drought out west. Hurricanes come along the coast and you know, parts of North Carolina and South Carolina are still not uh, back to normal. Populations are shifting in and around the world. When the, we, the doctor gave me the, the good news of, of no more cancer, I was overwhelmed and really thought, what now? What's next? What, what do, do I go back to normal? Do I go back to what was or what do I do now? And I think in many ways that's what Jesus is telling the disciples. What now? In, in a time of Jesus as he was standing before the, um, the temple, the palace, the, the fortress garrison that had the Roman soldiers in it, the priests running around the, the temple, he was facing a shifting time as well. Many options, many uh, the, uh, were before the people. There were different groups, the, the, the Pharisees and the Pharisees, were one group, right? Let's get along with the Romans. There, there were the Romans all around them. There were the Essenes who sort of withdrew out into the, the desert to, to be out of the way. There were those who were called the, uh, the assassins. Judas Iscariot was one of those who thought the revolution should come and will overthrow uh, the Romans, we'll get rid of the Romans and we can be a, a new Jewish state. In 70, in the time of Mark's life, Mark's own life, there was a re rebellion within Israel and in Jerusalem. And the Romans being the Roman, destroyed the city down to the very earth itself, burned everything, salted everything, so no, Jerusalem would not rise again, though it did. And then the, the, the last group of the, the rebels, the Jewish rebels, ended up in Masada. Maybe you may know of this. Where instead of surrendering to the Romans, they committed community suicide. But when the Romans breached the walls of that fortress, there was not one living Jew. Not one stone upon stone survived in Jerusalem itself. And in time, we know the Roman Empire fell. If you go to Rome, I think you see the ruins of that empire. But there was another group within the city of Jerusalem. That was the Christian church. And out of that disaster, it grew. It spread. 
Because I think Jesus gave them another option instead of all that magnificent buildings that would last forever, except they didn't. They would be given words to speak to the world. Words of hope. As they began to go to, to the to their sort of their ends of the world, but their own of their own life, they began to feel that sense of endurance in the face of things not holding. For, uh, William Butler Yeats wrote a poem at the time of the Irish Revolution in 1918, where the center cannot hold, things fall apart. And at times in our world, we think things are not holding together. Things are falling apart. As we encounter this hope, the sense of endurance in Jesus Christ, we are given the Holy Spirit to, to go out into this world full of hope and full of love. When I was given a number of weeks to prepare for this sermon, many weeks, but it was only until Friday night we really got serious about this. It was uh, Martin Luther shared about a sermon that he was preparing. He, he, he thought the Holy Spirit would give him the words to say on the time he would stand up to preach. So he was busy doing many other things. And he got to the pulpit and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and says, Martin, you are not prepared. And that was the only word the Holy Spirit gave to him that, that day. Not prepared. I think the disciples were saying, give us a time schedule. Let us know when this is going to happen so we can get ready or we'll put off until then until the very last moment and we'll get ready then. I uh, made the comment, I love that song that we sang, but it's not Christmas yet. There are those who are prepared for Christmas too soon in my book. My, some of my neighbors already have their lights up, which I can understand, put it up in the warm weather, but don't turn them on until maybe after Thanksgiving. My was running along with my daughter yesterday, and she has Christmas music on. And I says, "Not yet. <laughs> don't be, you know, don't get over prepared." I they, they wanted the time, so Lord, we'll put off until the last minute. Uh, I was thinking about April fifteenth. You know, that's an important date. But how many of us put off until April fourteenth to get everything? Filed. My wife is saying, yeah, that's, that's you. I used to shop for Christmas, Christmas Eve. The best bargains and crowds are gone by then. <laughs> but now I, 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 uh, I take my wife with me because I have no idea what she wants. And if I, anything I buy, she returns. So that's, that's, my, that's, my, that's, my, that's, my, that's my story. But we, we, I think the disciples were those, let's put it off until the last, 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 last moment. But she says, no, no, be prepared now. Have that sense of now, have that sense of urgency now that we share with this world, this, this Jerusalem, this world that's facing this things that cannot hold anymore, that we share with them hope. We share with them the sense of that they can be saved, that they are loved by God, that as we were getting ready for Christ, Thanksgiving yet, we're getting ready for Christmas yet. We can share with the world our thanks and our Christmas love and, the, and the, what hope comes at Christmas. There's a sense of, you know, now, now, as we see the things that are falling apart, things that are not holding together like we thought they would, we still have God's magnificence. We still have 
Jesus' grace. We still have the hope to hold on to. We still have the love to hold on to. And the Holy Spirit will give us the words to share with others who are maybe facing, oh, my world is disappearing. My world is, is, is not there for me like I thought it would be. Like I thought it was promised to me. It just, we have an ease, I think, in our day and age. A disease, as you were, that we're just not, not ready or being ready. I'm not sure how, you know, after, after the election, one of the things I would think we should be more involved, let's not wait until the next election comes around and, and participate to be engaged, but somehow get engaged now as we are reorganizing Sheridan and Adams Township. Should we show up for our council meetings? Should we, you know, send letters to our representatives? Or just maybe show up at their office and say, hey, I want to share with you. And let's not wait till the next vote we can deliver, but be more engaged. But beyond that, I think we need to be more engaged in our community, just with our neighbors. In growing up in the west side of Chicago, I know all my neighbors. Like, I know everybody over in this section. I have to develop a few more, but I know almost everybody in this section from Bob and on back. I know everybody, all my neighbors, the Sullivans to, to, the, to the left, uh, Mrs. Padgett to the right. I have to admit, in my community that I've lived in eight years, I don't know one of them. I don't know one. Do we live in that kind of world where we don't know our neighbors? I, I've served churches in Indiana for 30 some years. And one of the expressions was, I used to know everybody in town. Don't know any more. Don't know them anymore. And my always engagement, whose fault is it that? Maybe we need to be more engaged into this world. Sharing our hope and our love. Sharing our faith. Maybe that's where we begin is to build a community that will endure. Not magnificent rocks or beautiful buildings, but a community of love and of hope. That is the church that sort of survived, that grew out, that endured that time in Jerusalem knew the pain of their Savior's death, who knew the, their own pain, but were able to survive, able to, to grow, able to share. Amen. Let us pray. But God, may my words this day be your word. May it be a, a word that engages that comes home, that strikes a chord in someone's heart. And if so, it's your word, Lord. And if, if my words have failed, it's mine. But Lord, in you is our hope. In you we find love. In you, in you we find our salvation. May that be our word this day. Amen. If you would stand in the closing or join in our closing hymn, I know whom I have believed, which is number 714. And uh, let us sing loudly, joyously. And the, I have to admit, the choir director is sitting right next to me, and she did not invite me to join the choir. 